really has been, if it's the law to teach this stuff, fine, teach it. But we would like it to be taught in a manner that is sensitive to the predominant sort of community representation in a place like Tower Hamlets, or at least in an individual school within Tower Hamlets. My children go to schools that are 80-90% Muslim communities' children, right? So my point is, yes, we want to abide by the legislation, but we want to do it in a manner, we want to, the school to show us how it is taking Muslim sensitivities on board as it develops its policies. In the end, the policy that was put forward by Tower Hamlets Council, in our minds, was completely inappropriate for our children because it was teaching, introducing these things to children in inappropriate ways at, an, at, at, at the wrong age, at an age that was too young. So I usually say to parents, it's very, very simple, I don't want to be explaining what LGBT is or what same-sex families are to my seven-year-olds. I'm happy to do it at an older age, but to my seven-year-old, I, I don't know how to have that conversation. I don't want my child, my child coming home to me saying that, that, that I have sons, right? But I don't want, 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 want my son, I have one now who is three and a half, right? He's going to go through all of this. Coming home to me saying that he, he was shown a picture of a vagina, right? Which is the council's express policy is not only to teach private parts, but to teach the parts of the private parts with the names. And the anatomy of... Uh, anat yes, anatomy, anatomy of, of sex. Anatomy of a human body. Yeah, anatomy of sexual parts, basically, right? Um, but the argument but is... To do that, but to do that graphically... But you, you, you are sex sexualizing it. Because what the council is saying, we're teaching anatomy anatomically. Why are you sexualizing it? A child who is seven years old, if it can learn about the eyes, about the nose, about the ears, private parts, our genitalia, is part of the anatomy. Why are you saying we cannot teach them? What is graphic about teaching anatomy? Okay, well, we're not that. For, for me, that argument is something of a red herring. Why? Because if, if I don't, if, if it is, if I am sensitive about this culturally, then the school has to respect that. About the, 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 the response to that question, before I try to respond to it philosophically and logically, the question is that. If I have a sensitivity, this is a democratic country, if I have a sensitivity to it for religious reasons and I feel that it is inappropriate to show my child a photograph or even a cartoonified image of, of a male or female private part at the age of seven, if I can articulate that this is something that is unacceptable in my religion or in my culture, that should be taken on board. But on the same, I'm coming to you, Noor. The same, same could apply to children who are younger three, four-year-old, say, for example, from the Bangladeshi background where predominant our Hamlet's community would come from, if they were in Bangladesh and these kids are swimming in the pond, they would be naked, little yeah. kids, they would see each other's genitalia quite openly. Yeah. That is not a problem. But the moment you are teaching anatomy becomes a sensitive problem. I don't understand. There is a problem. What's because, the problem? Because of the fact that if you, those children are not being shown photographs of genitalia. There's a very big difference. But they don't children, have to see the photographs. They're get, seeing them live in front no, of children, them. Children, yeah, but they're not, our children, the, our children are not, they're not, we're not, they're not from that culture. No, they are. They're, so if a human... No, my, my, my son, I mean, I don't know where you're going with this. My son hasn't grown up in Bangladesh. My son didn't grow up, grow up... I'm swimming I'm, I'm, with I, other naked I, children. I didn't say they have to. I'm saying anatomically. Yeah, but if it doesn't apply... Anatomically, they have to know about the opposite sex. Yes, they do. So if they do know about the opposite sex anatomically, okay, let me spell why, this out. why so are let, you Why are you I don't know, Let me spell this out to you, right? Okay. The bottom line is, I don't want my child to be sensitized to something that is that is basically one step down from pornography. Okay, let's go to Noor. I'm coming to you. I've not... Yeah. I've not I want to address this point. I, I want to understand. Uh, imagine I am the local authority. I am the education officer involved in but the government. But that's government. not the point. Wait, 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 are you okay with it? Wait for a second. Are you okay with it? I, I, I'm the presenter. You're the, you're the guest. So, Noor, ask you the same question. So, what's the issue here? What is it... What is inappropriate that is being taught to us <clears throat> kids in school? I don't address that, but I have to make the point uh, which is related to what Molana Shams was uh, getting Go at. On. Number one, the naming of the anatomy in itself is not a legal requirement. Yeah? Meaning especially with the ages that they are trying to push within the schools. So 
the reason why the local authority have said naming of these sexual organs at the age of five, year one, is under the, uh, under the guise of safeguarding. However, when you explore all of the safeguarding, and this is something we actually, as a collective, along with the Islam the Mosque and others, brought to uh, 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 legal opinion, which went and literally thrust through each of these points, and it made it clear from lawyers and barristers who deal with sexual exploitation cases and um, that th this doesn't in any way improve safeguarding. And that's the key part. If you're going to introduce something, show us the benefits of it. Show us the facts. You haven't answered, yeah. you haven't answered my question. No. You've gone to something else. No, I have to make that point very clear, though, because there is no legal requirement for them to teach those parts. So why is there such a push to then teach it? The guys they may use is about um, safeguarding. That's not real. That's not even correct. The one they might say about knowing the anatomy, it's not even part of national curriculum science uh, until no, you get wait, to puberty. He, I, he did not disturb you at yeah. all. Uh, uh, until you get to puberty. Yeah. So this is the point. If you look from a factual perspective, what is a necessity for this? It's, there is no real argument for that. The problem that I'm seeing here in terms of uh, gen genitalia, look, I'll be very clear. I've got younger children than the age they're actually saying. So I've had a four-year-old who might ask me, what is this specific part? Just say you're cleaning them or giving them a bath. So no problem. I have no problem in ex saying that this is the specific name for the body part, the scientific name. The issue that we have is when you take a discussion that is between a parent and a child in a safe environment, and you take it into a classroom where there are many other children around, there has been incidences where parents have said that children have gone into the playground after lessons such as this and said, show me mine and I'll show you yours. That's a real impact of talking about this at a too tender young age where the children don't understand and it can expose to further safeguarding. In fact, under safeguarding, one of the things they tell you is a telltale sign is if a child comes home using certain language, like names of genitalia, and they shouldn't know, then that's a, usually a warning sign to say there's a safeguarding issue here. So now you're introducing it within the classroom at such a young age, you can't tell is there a safeguarding issue here or not. So all of these reasons coming together are, are the reason why there is an issue with it. But if, the if issue is, about, from, it's in a classroom if you're coming from a, if you're coming from If you're coming from a non-Muslim perspective, yes. One, part, one cannot see what you are saying as problematic. But why should we come from a non-Muslim perspective? Wait, wait, I don't wait, understand. Because you, We're wasting precious air time coming at this from an angle that is completely irrelevant to me, you, and to our no, community. No, it's not, because the law of the land... How said, many non-Muslims are watching no, no, this program? It this is a matter. complete waste of time. Shams, I'm asking you a specific question. Try and answer that. Yeah. And that is, if the law says you have to teach... No, it doesn't. The law doesn't say it doesn't. you have to That's teach. It. This is what you're is not taking on board. The do? law does no. not say you have to teach it. The law has... It, the law stipulates certain records. The law... Part, first of all, legislation is passed. DFES interprets the legislation and makes certain recommendations to schools, but suggests, but tells, advises schools to implement these recommendations in consultation with parents, taken on board, let me finish, taken on board the sensitivities of parents. This is why I am jumping straight to the issue of parental sensitivity. No, but this is going to change now with the new uh, update to the uh, propos a proposal for uh, uh, sex and re relationship education in schools, that's not going to be a, a relevant anymore. It's no, not going to be. No, change. No, this is it. Just this watch. is the law. Just watch the law as it develops. Very mm. soon, the next level is going to be sorry, parents have no say over it. We are going to give you what you're going to teach at every school. It's going to become ma mandatory. That's the conversation that is taking place in the corridors of power in the Department of Education. So, our discussion here... There's no evidence of that. Just watch. But we can't just make stuff up. We're That's not, not happening. We are not making stuff that up. That is not this, happening. Look, saying, I don't know, wait. I'm, the asking point you, is, I'm asking you a simple question. Answer that question, which is that what is it that they're teaching that is inappropriate? That's where we began. And you're saying what's inappropriate in our conversation, what they're teaching... Okay, let me... Let, the for the question. sake of the viewers, let, let me, me ask you my, this question. I, the, when you I'm want to teach you this, question, so hold on. look, I didn't come here to argue with you about this issue. And this is, I'm sorry, but this is really vexing. You, I've come here to discuss a really important community issue that I, that I am deeply involved in and that I take very, very seriously. And you, can't and you want to discuss with me about some red herring. You, this is not a debate. You, you I've not come to a you, debate you, show. You can't answer my question. No, I don't want to answer your question because it's irrelevant to the community no, it's that not. is watching. it's very relevant. At what? I am asking you a question. It's very relevant. Yes. Answer that question. Show me how why it's relevant. So what is if, it? Because I'm, I'm very good at arguing, by the way, so let's argue about this. What Please is explain it? to me how it's what relevant. What is it that they're teaching our, our kids that's inappropriate? You've not been able to answer that. Uh, able to answer that except saying... You're not listening. I said that when, when it comes to teaching my children about genitalia, the proposal is to 
present my seven-year-old with a photograph of a penis and a vagina. So you said at the age of seven is inappropriate, yeah. but what age is inappropriate for you? That's not the point. It's a question of pedagogy. If I am to teach my child... At what age about, is it appropriate? Right. If I am to teach my child about private parts, mm -hmm. I will teach it in a manner described by Brother Noor. I am not going to put photographs so are you saying of in school, other people's genitalia. Are you genitalia. saying in schools they should not teach a sex at all? I didn't say that. What are you saying? That's right. I'm really, I really don't understand why we're here now. No, no, you have to... I don't understand what this show is for. You have to understand the questions. If you, can, if you do not understand the question, ask me and I'll answer it for you. So, to, over to you, Noor. So, what is it that they're teaching inappropriate? Because we're trying to unpack that before we can present what is it that we would like them to be taught. If we can't even identify what it is that they're teaching inappropriately, how are we going to discuss the second part? So, tell me, apart from genitalia, and uh, Sham said earlier on, at the wrong age, what else are they teaching inappropriate? As mentioned, the vast majority generally is okay. The three kind of key areas that have been popped up that have got contention is one is regarding uh, uh, um, the, the teaching of the sexual organs, yeah? But that is in very much relation to the age appropriateness. Okay. It's not denying so, so the teaching what? of it. Go, yeah? that's what. What's the the other one, again, is about the promotion of LGBT families. So that, that hasn't yeah. come yet. Okay, yeah. that's the second. And, and the third one, which is interesting enough, which isn't focused on so much, but it's the introduction of puberty at a younger age than seen before. Okay, I've got a caller waiting. Hello, Salaam Alaikum, caller. Hello. Salaam Alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, I'm offering you to the studio. You are? What is your name and what would you like to say? Brother, brothers, my name is Mukhlis, yeah? Okay. Okay, um, firstly, I've been watching your podcast or show or whatever it is. It's a uh, live show. Live show. Can I just give you my quick input? Yes, please go ahead. I think you're going off the topic, brothers. No problem. What would you like to say? What's your what's your contribution I'd, to the I'd discussion? Like to, I'd like to see you guys discuss your opinions rather than it becoming an argumentative discussion. Okay. But what would you like to add to the discussion? What would I like to add? Yes. I'd like to add... Can I speak directly to Brother Admiral Masur? You are. I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm asking you to okay, brother, make I your contribution so something. that we can... Uh, all, all of us can hear it. Okay. So you say um, the topic is about what's going on in our schools, yeah? Yeah. I'm a parent myself of three children. Okay. Now, at the age of five and six, where there's a classroom of females and males, of uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, the teaching of what is sexual parts, should that not be left at home to the parents as a Muslim? Secondly... The fact is, showing them what a penis is and what, it, what a vagina is, it could give them so many questions to answer. The sex gender issue and all of this stuff that they're trying to push through the schools to our children. And inshallah, if, if whatever their plan is, Allah plans better. But the fact is, at such a young age, do you really want them to be desensitized to all these issues about transgenderism and all of this stuff about LGBTQ communities? Okay. Thank now, you. That's just my opinion. Okay, very good. I think, I think you've made your point very clear. The, the, so the problem we are discussing here actually revolves around the introduction of LGBT community and culture that you are finding difficult. I'm talking to you, you mentioned earlier on, that at, at the back of it, all of these things are being taught. So it's to legitimize the LG, LGBT conversation, you think the sex and relationship education has been altered and changed. That's what you're suggesting. No, no, I'm suggesting so that. Explain that. So brother is asking, yeah. that at, at such a tender age, would you like to teach them? Or I would not, wouldn't like to teach my children all those things. Mm. W well, what are you saying? No. Same thing. It's age appropriateness. You have to go back. So at what age does yeah. it become appropriate? Well, this is the problem we're, we're facing. Well, that's one question, but I'll come to that. When you have a local authority, and this is across, across all London boroughs, have taken a si similar or same approach, which is giving guidance to the schools, mm -hmm. and schools 99.9% .9 of the time follow exactly the guidance given by the local authorities. They're saying, nope, from year five, from the first, as they walk through the door, I'm not year five, year one, five years old, we're going to teach them about uh, LGBT, different families. We're going to teach them about body parts. And they've said all of those things. When you deconstruct the arguments, and the DfE guidance gives no point to mention, we have to make it clear, for primary school, LGBT is not mandatory. They make it clear. 
Yeah, they may strongly recommend it. It's not mandatory. Number two is they talk about the body parts. Again, they don't talk about the body parts at all, mentioning it. It's logical to say that it will be taught in puberty. And that's at a later age when puberty is taught. So you're suggesting yeah. we should be taught at puberty? Of course. Okay. Well, that makes the most sense. Now, th th that's why the body parts, it becomes age appropriate. We're talking so about what, nine, thing. ten years old? So it will be around the year five. Year, at the earliest we say year five, year six. This is La the year last six, year yeah? of... So la last years of, of their primary schools. Oh, and then yeah? the first year. And then they'll go. So, so, this so is... and, uh, what we're discussing now is that teaching children sex and relationship in the way it's being done, both teaching anatomy, anatomy of sexual organs or the sexual organs themselves and teaching them LGBT at primary school is a problem as far as the Muslim families are concerned. That's what you're saying. Generally speaking, because Muslim families are not necessarily always exposed right. to these things. That's yes. very clear. Finally, we've got to the, the problem. Now, Shamsul Duha, what do you teach your children when you teach them at the right age? What do you, how do you teach them? And how should the school teach those children? Because the, the schools will teach. What do you think they should teach our children at the age of puberty? Obviously, they need to prepare our children to face puberty. So before puberty, they will discuss something. But from the age of puberty, what should they teach? And how should they teach? Parents to our own children, ourselves. No, I'm talking about parents and schools. Mm. What should we teach our children when it comes to sex and relationship? I've, by the way, I've got one caller waiting online. I'm going to take that while you're thinking about the answer itself. Salam alaikum, caller. Hello, Salaamu Alaikum. Salaamu Alaikum, Kola. Hello, Salaamu Alaikum. Can you hear me? We can hear you. What's your name, my brother? Okay. Brother, my name is Asaf. Uh, I've been working uh, with a lot of parents in regards to RSC dialogue with primary school. Okay. Uh, with uh, communications. I mean, my brother is quite familiar with it. Um, we've, you know, we've mobilized the community in trying to educate them in regards to what REC entails for parents and children. There are other aspects when it comes to age appropriateness of the material that they use. Those are the issues that most parents have and the uh, LBGTQ uh, agenda as well that's recently been pushed uh, if to our pa uh, children, especially at a time when they don't need it, when there are other, other methods that they can use or other materials they can use to describe relationships and uh, other aspects of it. Um, so majority of the uh, concerns from parents' side is, you know, why are the school, you know, not looking at the guidelines, following the guidelines, and predominantly looking at the Muslim community that they serve and not catering to their needs. Those are the main concerns and okay. why the school are going against most of the parents' wishes to revise the policy or revise the curriculum. And what, what response did you get when you were able to galvanize your local community? A what? lot of the communities, you know, I think Brother New came in and actually spoke to some of the parents. Uh, we had over about 100 parents uh, at the time to educate us on what REC, uh, you know, stands for and what, what the purpose of it is. And a lot of the issues that our, uh, Brother New has already highlighted from a legal stand, uh, standpoint and a statutory and non-statutory standpoint, some of the things they can take out and actually, you know, compromise on, but they're not willing to do so. So this is where the conflict comes in. It, you know, where, you know, they, most of the parents feel that their parental right as to educate their kids has been taken away from them. And what we decided is, you know, uh, best for the child, I mean, in regards to the school, oh, we want, we've chosen this and this is what we're going to teach. Okay. When Thank it doesn't kind of, you know, come, when it doesn't actually kind of adhere to our own faith, it's not faith sensitive, it's not age appropriate, and you know, is it necessary at the age that they're wanting to teach you at? Okay, thank you for that very um, uh, clear point that you make about your own campaign at your local level. Um, I'm going to take a quick break, but when I come back, uh, obviously we're going to be hoping to expand and explore what is it that we can teach our children at an appropriate age and appropriately, both. What would we like to teach them? What's allowed within the Islamic framework? and what we should be teaching to prepare them to live in a non-Muslim society, which is predominantly not Islamic, of course. Don't go too far away. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to our program. We're talking about how we can play a role, parents and schools, 
teachers along with our communities, mosques and madrasas? How can we play a role in teaching our children relationship and sex in a responsible way? That was my introduction, remember? That's what we want to do. So we were unpacking earlier on, what is it that's being taught to our kids that is inappropriate? If there is something that's inappropriate, let's find out what, that, what it is. Uh, Brother Noor earlier on said the three areas of inappropriateness that's been taught to our children is that our kids are being taught these aspects well before they're ready for these kind of things in life. So they're being sexualized. LGBT discussion is being also thrust upon them when it is not relevant to them in their lives. And there is also the issue of safeguarding. The consequence is that safeguarding issues become a major issue. Those are the three things you mentioned, right? Yep, there will. Age appropriateness is the overarching issue for all of those three so issues. So how do we overcome this? Parents have a responsibility to teach their children. Yes. Let's face the truth. How many of our parents actually know how to? Yep, without doubt, there are very limited parents that you will find who are actually covering this topic at home. And that's to do with <clears throat> the fact that culturally we've had issues uh, where parents um, have never addressed this topic. It's always a shied away topic. No, no, we don't talk about this. And it has this impact. And so one of the things I've always talked about is trying to empower the community. In fact, within my parenting course, oh, there's a whole segment called Islamic RSE. How parents, what do you need to cover, and how you can go about covering it. So it is an important thing. So it's true, a lot of parents aren't covering it. But at the same time, that in itself shouldn't take away the parental responsibility and the schools now have assumed everything and say, we're going to teach them everything. Because, without... because they feel that the parents are not doing the job. Well, that's the argument that's being used. Okay, yes. let's take some calls. People, people are waiting to talk uh -huh. to us, inshallah. Hello, salamu alaikum, caller. Hello. Hello, yes, salamu alaikum. Salamu alaikum, Mansur bhai. Ji bhai, what is your name? What would you like to say? Um, basically, I've been uh, listening to the first part of the conversation before the break. Uh, you do, I understand you're coming from a scientific sort of point of view of education in terms of anatomy, and the other brother was talking about more religious point of view. I think the thing is, when we, you know, nationally, we are challenged in any, anyone who challenges the education system on a, a religious point of view, straight away there's a back foot and they don't listen. You know, it's, uh, as soon as you say you're Muslim and you're a Muslim parent and you're objecting, you know, they're, they're not even going to listen to you. The thing I would like to address from a scientific point of view, when you turn around and say, uh, looking at the anatomy, eyes is exposed. It's not a sexual uh, part of the body. Pri private parts is a term where it's used, it's, uh, the clue is in the name, private. There's a reason why it's called private, or else we're not going to be civilized human beings. That's why we wear clothes, because it affects the human mind and heart when someone is exposed to private areas. This how, is the first how, do you, how do you, how do you, as parents yourself, how do okay. you teach, so, how so do you gonna, teach your we're children? We're going to get away from, the thing is, the, the way the education system argue it, there are more, lots of, um, uh, you know, they're not parents, they're, they're um, atheists and so on. So they come from a scientific point of view. So what I'm trying to say, to challenge them on a scientific point of view, solely on scientific first part of the argument, because I was listening to your argument where you're coming from an anatomy point of view, and I am coming from the same point of view, because when the eyes looks at a body, a certain type of body, whether it's a vagina, whether it's uh, the uh, private part, we know whether you, you don't have to be a Muslim or a Christian to even understand this, that okay. it affects oh, the boy in a certain way. I, th I, th I, think, I think your point is very clear. I think I understand yes. you. And, and, no, it's pertinent because the thing is, this to, you know, for, for them to try to put the argument about teaching, about education, about private, uh, private parts through the back door, this is very pertinent. You know, okay. forget the parent to argue. I'm, afra I'm afraid I'm running out of time because I've got so many callers waiting. I'm going to have to rush yep. through some of those calls. Thank you. Well, well made point. Next caller. Hello, salamu alaikum. Hello, salamu alaikum, caller. Salamu alaikum. Hello, salamu alaikum. Please go ahead. 
No, I, I, I don't think we have the caller waiting. I'm so sorry. They probably have waited for a long time. Forgive us for the delay. We have got to take breaks, etc. So coming back to you. So imagine your child is, uh, or is approaching the age of puberty. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing they should be taught when it comes to uh, relationship and sex? The key part is, um, you're talking about, you know, we're talking about sex education, but if you unwrap the legal requirements, sex education isn't a requirement at primary, it is something mandatory at secondary, however, the right of withdrawal for parents remain exclusive throughout that period. Now, puberty isn't sex education, there's two different I'm, things. I'm starting with the puberty. Yeah. So, let's talk about, remember, puberty will also bring in the sexual elements at some stage, so you need to prepare your children mm -hmm. for the sexual urges that they feel, they will feel, the hormonal changes that they will notice, the physical body changes that they will notice. For a boy, he will notice certain changes, or, and for a girl too. How do, you, how do you introduce that to the children appropriately as well as Islamically? That's the question. Okay, well, this, if you look from a parent's perspective, then yes, within the home, how they teach it, it should be done where is the parent with the child. In, this is a safe environment. And you do have to come about and address these topics. So you will bridge it slowly, slowly. So before they come into puberty, some things they need to know about the body changes that will naturally happen. And, you know, for girls, there are specific changes. For boys, there are obviously specific changes that will happen. The reproductive side doesn't have to necessarily come in. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah? And so, so, that, that, that so, comes so you're talking segment. about introducing the physical bodily changes that they will experience. So you talk about bodily changes, that it then becomes very much linked to, once your body does start going through this process, now you become balir. And now if you are balir, you become responsible. And your, your actions are, are responsible. Salah, it becomes fard, and all of these topics become important. So that's why you need to make sure that you are addressing these topics all together. That's what we have as parents. Because at school, if they, even if they teach about puberty, they're not going to actually teach about tahara. They don't teach about no, of uh, all of those things. So, of course, it still is very much a responsibility of yours. Let's go to the caller. Hello, salam alaikum, caller. Salam alaikum, caller. Wa alaikum salam. What's your name, brother? Brother, my name is Abdul. Okay, what would you like to say? Okay. Brothers, I just wanted to ask, the aspect that you're talking about, could you relate it to Sunnah Hadith? and how Islamically it was done in the years before. That's a very good question. A very good question. How was it taught by the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to his companions and the children? And Tabi. We will inshallah do that straight away as soon as we have a, a, a moment. Just bear with me inshallah. We'll inshallah. answer that question. So, uh, uh, and, and while, I, thank you my brother for that question. I'm going to let you go, but we will answer it as well inshallah. So, here is the issue. I, and I want to raise this issue with all of you. As the children are growing up, um, as the children are growing up, we notice uh, they're more curious. We hear them discussing things between their friends. Of course, you as parents take note of what's going on and you start addressing those issues as soon as possible and not delay them. And one of the most important discussions our children uh, have through cartoons, through films, through Disney's, all the things that they see at home, is the boyfriend-girlfriend relationship that they're introduced to even from their fairy tale age. This, um, as, a, as, as a concept, you need to address. So already our children's minds have been somewhat uh, sexualized by the stories, by the drama, by the films that they're watching. It is. So when I had my two children, because we homeschooled both of them until they went to the secondary age, or un until they reached the uh, secondary age and went to secondary school. We addressed all those issues appropriately, and we addressed them adequately, and we prepared them to face the world in a way that is both Islamic as well as uh, it meets the basic scientific as, uh, and, and the educational criteria that we have in front of us. So we, we found it extremely, extremely challenging, but we overcame it by learning how to teach them those things appropriately at the appropriate age. Never shied away from discussing these topics at all. Um, and other parents who were in our area, in our network, who are also doing homeschooling, were learning from our experiences and were doing the same thing. So our experience was slightly different and quite, um, um, I, I don't want to say easier, but I think it was much safer because we had our children at home until they went to secondary school. Um, it was much easier for us. But I know parents who don't have that luxury, and obviously they have to face the challenges 
Um, okay, let's take the call first, and then we'll come to uh, 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 Sheikh Shams Duha to get the same question answered, inshallah. Let's get the call. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Who is calling and what would you like to say? Uh, my name is Mr. Fatima, and I would like just to add an, op- an input to this um, show. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Please. So Maybe. I would like just to make an example of a mother, Muslim mother, with the children. I've been told, for example, I'm just going to take a simple example that is, as soon as a mother gets pregnant, she will have a scan at 12 weeks, and at 20 weeks she will also have a scan, just to check further details about how the baby is growing. And then after the birth, she will be t- the mother will be told to breastfeed is the best thing, and at six months to start fe- winning the baby. So I would say what the government is doing right now is not something bad. There is something good and there is something bad. But what I would say, consider the case that I would say, as soon as I give birth to my baby, that I want to win at this stage instead of breastfeeding. They will tell me certainly that scientifically it has been proven. M- my sister, I don't mean to be rude, but your line is very, very poor. And I'm only hearing every other word. And I'm not making a clear sense of what you're saying. So I, I'm, I'm assuming our listeners are having difficulty as well. Forgive us for uh, uh, not being able to hear you. Um, you know, it's much better, but please make it short and quick. Bismillah. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. If I will summarize, I would say, doing the other things, you will be told that to follow step by step, and that's the good thing. But when it comes to a child, how you will educate as a parent that know most than every, every other person, they want to tell us what to do for our child. So the problem is here, it's not what the government wants to teach our kids, it's how and when. So my question for the brothers who are here... It's very clear. I'm going to come to Sheikh Shams al-Duha for that question to be answered. So how and when has been uh, something that Noor and I was discussing earlier on, and I wanted to ask you the same question. So um, Noor was saying before puberty, you teach them about the onset of puberty and how they should be prepared for the bodily change, what will happen, etc. But up post-puberty, how do you actually introduce this topic from an Islamic perspective? And one caller just called and said, how did the Prophet or the companions or the scholars in the past teach the children as they grow up this topic? So go ahead. Well, the wisdom of, I mean, the, when I first was introduced to these topics, I was introduced to them through fiqh, uh, through tahara. If our children, if, we, if all of us make sure that we ch- teach children the masail of tahara and bulugh, masail that are specifically related to uh, the masail of puberty, then almost all of the discussions, including questions around sex, will come up and will be discussed. But they have to be discussed at the right age. That means that uh, you know, boys become physically balik around the age of 12 as an average. So it, uh, yes, they, they start to become balik. I mean, officially by age they become balik at 15, but many of them will start having work dreams and so on at the age of 12, girls a little bit earlier. So it's a good idea to start introducing these conversations around the age of 10, towards the end of primary school. So when you say tahara, you meant... Uh, you, you mean uh, introducing them the concept of cleanliness from the Islamic perspective. Yeah. I'm just translating the same yeah, so word. Cleanliness, so cleanliness from the Islamic perspective isn't just about how to make wudu. It's about how to clean yourself after you go to the toilet. It's about what a fard bath is. So the whole context of a fard bath brings in the whole question of puberty, wet dreams, sex, sexual pleasure. Uh, all, all of these things cannot be explained without context. So, so when you naturally, do that... a, a, an almost complete conversation uh, with regards to relationships as well as sex, as well as puberty, happens within the context of a comprehensive discussion about Tahara. You know, this is so interesting. Exactly this is what happened in my own house with my two children because we homeschooled them. And when we were homeschooling them, I was teaching them the Islamic studies topics. And when it came to cleanliness, Tahara, as we put it, all of those discussions took place. But they did ask... So, Dad, what is sex? Yeah, naturally. So, now, what is sex? You have to explain this to them, right? So, here we are trying to say, while many parents may not know how to answer this question, and Noor was saying many schools identified that gap. Yeah. And therefore, they decided, actually, the parents are not teaching their children. Whatever cultural background they're coming from, we're going to have to teach it. We don't, the Muslim community, as a t- tradition, we don't have a sensitivity to the content of relationships and sex education. We have a sensitivity to certain pedagogic 
question. Certain issues of pedagogy. The question of which age to start is an issue of pedagogy. It's an issue that's to do with teaching methodology, teaching strategy. It's not a question of content. We don't have a problem with any of the content. 99% of the content is fine. Yes, most likely we wouldn't have taught about LGBT in the manner that it would be taught in a school. But for the most part, children need to know that these relationships exist. Of course. So there isn't a problem with that. The problem is introducing them at for us, for example, in Timeless, in our campaign, the problem is introducing them at Key Stage 2. So what the, the fundamental issue here is, this is being addressed and uh, taught to our children too early. That's what the biggest yes, problem is. Yes, our main issue, and we've had several meetings with the mayor and council officers about this, that fundamentally our issue is that we, that we think it is being introduced too early and we would like the council to at least demonstrate that in, a, in, a, in, an, er, in an area so well populated by Muslims, which is a positive thing, such a multicultural area, where is the evidence that the council and the schools are taking on board Muslim communities and would, Wouldn't that be nationally applicable, Noor, if the evidence suggested that actually there is no benefit in doing this to the children? In fact, reverse is true because you said earlier on you have heard or you've got cases of safeguarding because children are being taught about sex too early that they're starting to experiment some of these aspects of sex. Uh, so if that's the case, shouldn't we be presenting an alternative evidence to say, hey guys, here is the evidence on the ground. It's um, bad for everybody. Don't, let's not do it. When the DFA had its consultation in the whole process of shaping the RSC curriculum right. or, or the guidance, in fact, they didn't get an overwhelming, they didn't get a majority in terms of saying, yes, actually, there was very much a majority saying, no, we don't want this. But they still went ahead with it. The guidance given is very broad. It's the local authorities and then the schools are very narrowed it, which has caused the con issues of contention and which has pitted schools against parents. And that's a key part. A key part of the guidance is to ensure that you have consulted with the parents and that the policy is shaped and reflective of the community. And where we have densely populated Muslim communities, it's very strange to see this, because if you go to white dominant areas, guess what, this isn't an issue. There's why, no local why is it not an issue? Because a local authority isn't doing hasn't it. even bothered to say, yeah, do it at this age. They're just following the guidance and they're going ahead with it. In fact, the problem you're having is generally we're seeing more in the Muslim densely populated areas. So therefore, it does tie into the point, why? Is there an agenda at play here? These, these are legitimate questions that are being well, asked. Wouldn't it be a question that we need to raise at our local council level? So councillors in places like Tower Hamlets, we have, we have substantial presence of Muslim councillors. We have substantial presence of Muslim council officers. And yet this is happening right under our nose. Surely there is something uh, dodgy going on, uh, Sheikh Shams Abdul on this issue. This, I mean, the, there's, been, there's been pretty much silence from our councillors. Why are they silent about it? I mean, the, the, the story from inside is that the whole agenda is being pushed by a, a few people uh, around the mayor, um, some key officers, influential people within the council, and there's nothing anybody else can do. But really, there hasn't been any kind of lending of support to the community's voice in this. The community has found itself fending for itself, basically, alone. And the problem we have, which is really the, one of the important things that I wanted to say today, is that the council has finally yielded. This is the main status update to really tell our TV1 viewers. After a year, almost two years, right, of meeting after meeting, campaign after campaign, lost all sorts of drama, the council finally accepted our argument that this is not, this is not a legal requirement and has then, they, 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 and wrote to schools to that effect saying that the Muslim community, there are, we are having these meetings with Muslim community representatives and there's this alternative view or, or, with regards to this. And schools are not obligated to follow the council's guidance. Although the council backs its own guidance, schools are not obligated to follow it. They should take on board parents' opinions. What, what, what would you say what, to what, the... what, I, what I want to say to parents is, yes. it's now, the whole issue has been handed over to you. There is nothing myself, Ajmal Bai, Noor Bai can do anymore. We can't go to people's schools and say, this is unacceptable because we're not a parent at your school. The only people that can now have an impact are the parents. I was speaking to a, to a local deputy head today, and, and, you know, her concern fundamentally is parents are not coming forward. Now, as much as, you know, we're hearing callers calling in, expressing such vocal concern about this, but all of this is going to fall on deaf ears if, the, if we are not lending our voices at the school level. And, and a larger number. 
in large numbers and in all of the every really every formal channel of engagement okay. in every single school should be dominated with our voices at thank the you moment. i'm afraid time is already um uh, uh, on us and final words from noor what would you like to say to our parents because obviously uh, we need to tell our parents what to do now yep there's there's two key things one is that we've already touched upon is uh, as Mulan Shams mentioned, you need to go to your schools, you need to take up every avenue. That means if the consultations have happened and it's not been shambolic, you follow the complaints procedures, you see the process through. You do need to get parents together because numbers matter. And as mentioned by one of the callers, alhamdulillah, the other day I went, there's over 100 parents there. Alhamdulillah, they're, they're trying to obviously try to do something like this. Numbers have a big impact and we need to fulfill and use all of our legal uh, uh, rights that we do have to make change. And the second part of all of this is parents also need to upskill themselves mm. in order to counter some of this and teach the children at home. And just for practical use, there's two books I always do um, uh, uh, request parents get. They're very good books. They're done by Ilmburst. ILM Burst, which you can get online, is called Embrace a Muslim Boys Guide to Puberty and Embrace a Muslim Girls Guide to Puberty. It covers everything you've discussed about and it allows parents to go through the book with their children because sometimes going through a book is easier to discuss these topics about morality, about relationships, about sex, about puberty, all of those things, they're covered in there. And I always recommend this book Fantastic. to all parents. Thank you. Very practical advice at the end. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our program. Ultimately, the aim of our conversation here is to find out what the problem is unpack the problem and find a solution. I can't give you a solution in a one hour program. We can't. We can only point um, you in the right direction. Parents have a responsibility. You have a responsibility. You need to teach your children the very, very basics of life. Not just leave your schools and the teachers to be the caretakers or the teachers of your children. You are the primary caretakers of your children. You are the real educators. So please take a very important and decisive role in it, as both of our guests have said. And secondly, get involved in the campaigns. If you think things are not being done appropriately, it's your right to ensure that your child is getting appropriate education and your sensitivities are being respected. Get involved. Don't sit at home, do nothing. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a context, and that context is we're a minority, in a majority non-Muslim society. We have an added responsibility to create more protective, more safeguarded, and more inclusive approach. The benefit of our approach should also benefit the wider society. If we can demonstrate that our methodology is working, others will follow that. That's the global responsibility that we all carry. For today, I want to thank my guests, Shams al-Duha, and Noor Chaudhry for their time and their contribution. And I want to thank you all for calling in and making your valuable contributions. For some of you who called and you couldn't get through, apologies, uh, we couldn't help. The line was very poor, but please do stay with us. We'll be back, inshallah, in two weeks' time with another interesting, exciting topic. Until then, from me and my team, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.